Dan Hussein. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of you and your family. Say Ameen. Ameen. So now we're going to go ahead and introduce our, our keynote speaker, inshallah. Uh, a lot of times I hesitate reading long bios, uh, but some of our established speakers, subhanallah, uh, there's so much they've done in a short time that it's, it's impressive. And the reason it is important for us to highlight the achievements or their engagements and involvements is not to praise them. Because knowing them, they're doing it for a higher purpose. But rather for us to look up to this and see that what we can achieve and what can be done. So let me just share this with you, especially I want the youth and our students to pay attention to the bio and, and set targets and goals for yourselves in what you can do and what you can achieve in a, in a short span of time. <clears throat> so Mufti Hussain Kamani was born and raised in Elizabethtown, Kentucky. His journey to pursue his sacred Islamic knowledge began at the age of six, subhanAllah. And by the age of nine, he had memorized the whole of Quran. <clears throat> to further advance his study in Islamic sciences, he later traveled to United Kingdom and pursued formal Islamic authorizations, or ijazah. For seven years, Mufti Kamani studied a rigorous curriculum covering Arabic, Arabic language and literature, Islamic jurisprudence, tafsir of the Holy Quran, a hadith, Islamic philosophy, and aqidah. Afterwards, he was selected for a postgraduate level course in Islamic law and legal verdicts, which he completed within two years. He later earned his graduate degree in business management from the University of Coventry in UK. Mufti Hussein Kamani currently resides here in Dallas, Texas. I don't know if uh, many of you know that because he moved here from Chicago and somebody was asking me today who's picking him up from the airport. So I said, Alhamdulillah, we don't have to do that anymore. But we, you, do, uh, you do owe us some visits to the school so that nobody asks that anymore, inshallah. Inshallah, I'll put you on the spot for that, inshallah. Uh, he served as an imam for over 10 years in different communities around the country. He also serves as an instructor for Qalam Institute, where his class prophetic code has been studied by thousands. By the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the co-founder of KamaniOnline.com, internationally recognized clothing brand for men's design wear. During his pastime, he also enjoys jujitsu, so, so watch out, inshallah. So I'm going to invite uh, Sheikh Mufti Kamani, inshallah, to the podium. Please, for this, do, do remain in silent out of respect because what he has to share is very, very valuable. Takbir. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salamun ala ibadihin ladhi nastafa. Khususan ala sayyidi rusuli wa khatam al-anbiya wa ala alihi laskiya wa ashabihi latqiya amma ba'd. Fa'a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Iqra' bismi rabbika al-ladhi khalaq. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. Iqra' wa rabbuka al-akram. الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم صدق الله العظيم. As you must have heard on the bio, I was born in a small town in Kentucky, known as Elizabethtown, Kentucky. I'm assuming no one here has ever heard of that place, and if you have heard of Elizabethtown or been there, your life really sucks because you're not supposed to go there, you're not supposed to know about this place. It's one of those small hick towns that just exists and that's it. In our town as we grew up, we didn't have a masjid. The closest thing we had to a masjid was the American army base at Fort Knox, which was 20 minutes away from where we lived. So the Muslim community would gather together Fridays and we'd go to Fort Knox and we had special permission to get in there. And we'd go and offer our Friday prayers and that was it. A group of Muslims gathered together and they said, you know what, we need to change this. We can't keep going to the American army base for our Jummah Salah. We have to have our own place to pray. So they established a masjid. But there was no one willing to move to Elizabethtown, Kentucky as our imam. That was our biggest problem. And this is like in the late 80s. So most people were interested in moving to New York, Michigan, um, Detroit in particular, Chicago, Dallas. Nobody was here then either, so don't get too full of yourselves. Right? Similarly, no one wanted to move to um, Etown either. 
Luckily, somehow, we were honored by a Hafid visiting us in the month of Ramadan. He came for Taraweeh prayer. He was a young man, and I still remember his name. He used to always read the Qur'an. Read the Qur'an, read the Qur'an, read the Qur'an so much. One time I sat with him, and I remember this because at that time I was maybe five or six years old. And I said to him, Shaykh, how much Qur'an do you read a day? He said to me, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on average in the month of Ramadan, I finish two Qur'ans every day. Two Qur'ans every day I finish. He at the time must have been 18, 19 years old. He was a young kid. He wasn't even old and he was very young. Now, mashallah, he's a big sheikh uh, and he's a famous uh, person now. But at that time, he was no one. I mean, no one in terms of his age. He was still developing himself. So I came home one day and my, fa my father said to me, Hussein, I need you to do me a favor. And I said to him, Abba, of course, what do you want? He said to me, I need you to give me your life. I always wanted to memorize the Qur'an, read the Qur'an. I always wanted to study the deen and become a scholar. But unfortunately, when I was young, there was a separation between our countries. And we had to choose one side or the other. Half the family was here, the other half the family was there. I was one of the youngest people at the time in the family, so I had the responsibility of providing for people. Moved to America, came with the intention of education, had to leave my education, get into a job, worked, 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 and one by one called everyone from back home to America. And by the time it came for me to go and study the Qur'an, I was too old. So he said to me, Hussein, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to go and do the thing that I couldn't do in my life. And at that time, I was five or six years old. I had no idea what I was saying yes to. I said, of course. You know, young kids are very impressionable. So my father wanted to send me to study somewhere. And just like the Hifth program you have going on here, we were looking for a place for me to go and memorize the Qur'an. But unfortunately, in our town, there was no one there to teach us the Qur'an. The closest place was six, seven hours away. And even that was a half-baked option. It wasn't really a good option. Finally, my parents agreed that the best opportunity for me would not be in this country. It would be outside the USA. And I recall, I was six years old when I boarded the flight and I was leaving my hometown. And it was very hard for me to walk through security with my aunt's hand, hand knowing that I was walking away from my mother. Go and look at a six-year-old kid. And that's how tall I was. That's how big I was when I walked away. And I had to go to a small village. The village that I studied in, we had to go wash our clothes two miles away. We used to carry our clothes on our back for two miles when I was six years old. And there was a pond there. We used to go to the pond and we used to get these wooden sticks and we'd beat our clothes. Anyone know? Have you guys ever done that before? Yeah, you beat your clothes and then you wash them and you carry them back two miles. It was a very rough life. But then today I look at the community today and I see the opportunity that the kids have. You know, becoming a hafid at that time or going and studying the deen at that time was something very difficult. But then the Muslim community started growing. We became mature. We understood what our responsibilities were and we started walking in the right direction. Now you go back to the very same Kentucky. And not only is there one masjid there, but there are many masajid there. A city that was plagued and didn't have any scholars at all. Today you go there and there are many imams and scholars there. We look at Dallas and we see this very same city that once upon a time didn't have much. You go to anyone who was here 15, 16 years ago and they'll tell you there weren't that many Muslims here. They were the OGs. Most of us moved in here five, six, seven, eight years, nine, ten years ago. Before that, even Dallas didn't have much. And within the community, there came a responsibility. People were mature and they understood that if we wanted to make Islam prominent in this country, if we wanted Islam to be the status quo, if we want our children to be confident in their faith, we have to learn to give them the proper environment for that. You know, after the election, the recent election, that weekend I had to travel and I had to go to Ohio. So I kid you not, I, when, it came, when it was time for me to call my Uber and, and head to the airport, for a split second there was a thought that crossed my mind. You know what thought crossed my mind? How should I dress today when I go to the airport? And not that I view that the way I'm dressed is fard or wajib or anything, but the, fa the fact of the matter is this is who I am. This is how I've always dressed since I was a kid. This is a part of my identity. I won't call it a religious obligation, but I will say it's a part of me. 
And for me, it does hold an Islamic symbol for me. It's symbolism. It shows for me a standard, something that I know the Prophet wasallam wore something towards. And that's why I started off, what I started off in terms of promoting youth to wear something that's modest and something that covers them and something that isn't exposing to them. So I asked myself this question that, you know what? I know in Islam it's permissible for me to wear a loose pair of pants and put on a loose shirt as long as I'm not exposing my body, it's permissible for me to dress like that. Should I dress like that or should I continue doing the way, the, what I'm doing today? Should I dress like this? That thought came into my mind and I was still sitting up on my bed, kind of wiping my eyes and I was thinking about it. And you know what I decided to do? I refused to change and I decided to do what I've always done. I went to my closet, opened it up, put my thobe on, and I said, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And I said, Ya Allah, if in wearing this thobe lies my destruction, then no, I'm doing it for the sake of this deen. And why so? Because my teachers always taught me. What my parents always taught me, what my peers always taught me was, never apologize for who you are. Never apologize for it. You know, since the elections have happened, and even before the elections, the bigots have come out of their closets. We see racism very open now. Build a wall. Build a wall. These are chants that we're hearing, that are being recorded on video and being pub and are being published, published on news channels right now. This is what people are seeing. This is what our kids are seeing. I'm terrified because where I live right now, my kids go to a public school. And I myself am concerned that what if tomorrow someone says something to my child and then he becomes shameful of his religion or he's not confident enough there to stand and say, you know what, I want to continue being a Muslim. And it's at times like these that we're having Islamic schools are not only a good option on the table, they become more of a necessity. We need to think of the protection of our children. We need to think of giving our children the proper environment. We need to give them exposure to diversity. And you have to understand this, the one thing the Muslim Islamic school system offers that many even public schools don't offer is diversity. This is a very big thing. And we have a very big problem with this within our own country. White schools and black schools. It's very hard to find a school that's properly diversified. And you come into an Islamic school, and we were sitting here and we saw these HIF students standing on the stage there. I was thinking, let me try to find one predominant of, uh, ethnicity. I couldn't do it. I saw boys here and I saw girls here. They were all dressed modestly, they came forward, they read the Quran, and I'm not the type of person that records, but I pulled my recorder out because I thought that was beautiful. For me, that was an Iman rush. You know, this is where, this is how beautiful, it's as if the Prophet ﷺ was sitting in Medina Munawwara and he's telling the Sahaba that a time will come that this Islam will go to the four corners of the world. And the hypocrites were there and they thought, you know, uh, he's exaggerating hyperbole, it's not happening. But today we sit here 1400 years later and we see Sadaqa Rasulullah. The Prophet ﷺ spoke the truth. And now that opportunity comes on our shoulders. I remember once I asked my teacher this. I said to him, Shaykh, why is it that we don't have men like Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi during our times? We have scholars in our times. Alhamdulillah, we have great scholars. And we're thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that. But I said to him, where are the giants like Imam Bukhari? The giants like Imam Abu Hanifa? The giants like Allama Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah? Where are these people gone who were giants? Where are they gone? And he said something profound to me. He said, Hussein, you want to see Imam Abu Hanifa again? I have a solution. You provide me Imam Abu Hanifa's parents and tomorrow I'll give you Imam Abu Hanifa. You want to see Imam Bukhari again? Give me Imam Bukhari's mother first. Find me a lady who's willing to be Imam Bukhari's mother and tomorrow I'll give you Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi. You want to be Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi? You want to see him? Give me Imam Malik's mother first. Once you give me that mother, I'll give you everything. I'll give you whatever you want. We need those people first. We can't have hopes in the future if the present isn't in place. We have to work on the present right here. We have to work on this generation. This group of people sitting on these tables, in these chairs, have to understand their responsibility to the next generation. Every time I called my mother from Madrasa, every time I called her, Rahimahullah, I would say to her, Mom, what are you doing? And she would say, Hussein, you remember that sofa in the living room? I would say, yes. She'd say, I'm sitting on that sofa looking at the clock on the wall in front of me and I'm waiting for that day to come for my son to come back home. I spent one year of my life with my mother after I left when I was six years old. Only one year in my life. 
And I think to myself the other day, I was in a bookstore and I passed by and I saw this book on the shelf. I picked it up and I read the title of it. It was, it was written by a famous scholar, Mufti Taqi Uthmani. I'm sure many of you have heard of his name. I picked up the book and I read the title and I had tears in my eyes and I cried from my heart, Ya Allah, I hope one day one of my sons is worthy to write a book with the same title at least. Forget about the content. Let him just plagiarize and just write the same title. If even that'll do for me. You know what the title was? Imam Mufti Shaf, Mufti Taqi Uthmani wrote a book. It's called Mere Walid, Mere Sheikh. My father was everything for me. He's the one who made me who I was. Mufti Shafi Uthmani. And I was hoping that one day I would have this element, this connection of spirituality, of guidance in my own life. Then when my mother passed away, two, three months back, I sat there and I thought to myself, SubhanAllah, Mufti Taqi is confident to say his father was his sheikh. Wallahi al-Azim, my mother was my sheikh too. And if anyone comes to me and says to me, what was your path of education? How did you study? Tell us how we can guide our kids. I tell them, stop focusing on the kids and start focusing on yourself. I was a product of my mother and father. They made the sacrifice, Allah gave the results in me. Otherwise, the value of the person standing in front of you is nothing short of the soil that you walked on on the way into this hotel. You want to see your kids grow? You want to see our community grow? You have to put the value in yourself. You can't walk into these events thinking that, you know what, I'm just going to go there, listen to a lecture, and the person next to me is going to donate, and I'll walk out of there. Because laziness hasn't gotten the ummah anywhere. And if we carry that lazy attitude moving forward, we're not going to get anywhere. I go back to my community, and I go back to the communities that I travel to. Everyone's hoping that the next person's family will have a scholar. No one's willing to put their own children forward first. No one's willing to make that sacrifice. You want to do, you want to see something, you have to learn to do something. And this opportunity that this masjid is providing us with today, sitting here and I'm looking at these young girls and young boys who've come from public schools, different states, and they're talking about their experience at this Islamic school. If this isn't a good place to invest your money into, then please come and tell me what good is our wealth? What are we supposed to invest it in? You know, if we didn't learn after 9-11, if we haven't learned yet after the recent elections, then we'll learn very soon in the next days ahead of us. That those days of immigrants coming to America and living the, the suburban life where I buy my $300,000, $400,000 house and I buy my two cars and a minivan and I focus on paying that off and that's the beginning and end of my life and I get my kids through college, that's the beginning and end of my life. That self-focused life, if we thought that's what we were supposed to do and we continue doing that, we are only signing, we are only signing our faith in the future in this land. That vision of ours needs to change. We're not here just to pay off our homes. We're not here just to pay off our houses. We're not here just for our kids. We're here for the ummah at large. Today is a time for us. These gatherings are times for us to stand in front of Allah and say, Ya Allah, I played my part today. You called me, I came, I gave, and walk away. Be sincere, do your part, and walk away. You don't have to do any of the, of the heavy lifting. No one's asking you to come and teach every day. No one's asking you to, to, to organize a fundraising event. No one's asking you to pull the attendance of the kids or worry about the smaller issues that occur on a day-to-day -day basis. We have people that are giving their life for that already. We just need you to come forward now and play your part. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts from us all. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad. As-salamu alaykum. رب الغيوم جمالا وألون الدنيا بأجمل بسمة وأكون للخير العميم مثالا